I'm Katie Levinson. I'm Steve Hogan. And this is When Shit Goes Wrong. They changed the talk title. Um, but yeah, so we're going to talk about when things go wrong and like, and basically like, it's a kind of a broad topic, but we're going to try to dissect this as like, that's like what causes things to go wrong and then work on our troubleshooting techniques, generalize on, um, on like, on making things go better afterwards. Um, and so the first place we'd like to start with is when things go wrong, um, Sometimes it was preventable. This is like the easiest like uh, tree case if you were to like map it scientifically. They went wrong because we had the wrong expectation, expectations going into this. We just had like either naive or uninformed or even just like best educated like incorrect. So perfect example of this is one time I was living in Hong Kong and I was walking through the subway and I saw two guys beating the shit out of each other. And more accurately, one guy beating the shit out of the other guy. And I was like, oh no, this is awful. Uh, and so I pick up my cell phone and I call 911, um, which was a terrible assumption because I was in Hong Kong mm -hmm. and the number for emergencies there is not 911 and they don't speak English if I even had figured out how to call them um, because my Cantonese is appalling. So the first thing we're going to go through and is do is like list some frequently grossly incorrect assumptions that we go into with business. Um, and I'll start off like with a couple of easy ones. The first one is that um, you can manufacture from China during Q1, um, which is, is amusing because we come right out of our Q4 with all of our holidays and go right into their Q1 where they have all of their holidays. Um, and so Q1 is a terrible time to be manufacturing in China. And these are going to be kind of industry specific, but I hope that like these will be uh, generalized enough that like people will come out of this with like, oh, that's good to know, you know? Um, so like Q1 manufacturing China. Another one is when you manufacture from China and you manufacture boards, um, they will frequently swap out the parts for cheaper parts that they think you won't notice. Um, and so you need to work with your vendor and be very specific in that, no, I really do want you to use the components that I ordered. So you do like... Another one is if you do any manufacturing at all, I had one of the fellows from, um, what is this, the 2011 fellows? Yeah, one of the 2011 fellows um, hand in, a, uh, hand in a, a, a CAD drawing, and he said, all of these tolerances are plus or minus a tenth of an inch. And of course, they didn't come back that way. Um, and uh, but what he needed to do is he needed to prioritize, these ones really need to be within a hundredth of an inch, and these things aren't mating to anything else, so they're less important. Um, and he assumed, of course, that he was basically talking to a robot that would manufacture everything exactly according to his specs, um, which, of course, no one would ever do unless they're going to charge him an outrageous amount to have a human or a computer come in and measure every single thing. Um, so that kind of bring, it brings up a, a generalized part of that, which is assuming that your vendors actually care about what you're doing as much as you do. That's yeah. What, that turns out to be a really Do you have handwriting assumption. that's not bad? <laughs> I have handwriting that's not bad? No, what could go wrong with me, with me doing handwriting? Okay. Uh, I'm really sorry about this. If anyone actually wants us to do these notes up here, does this, anyone actually care? No. No. Okay. No. Assumptions failed. Whatever. <laughs> I don't need to write that shit. Okay. Someone else. Assumptions that were shit. That you went into doing business. I'm sure you've had them, kids. Yep. My my favorite business assumption that can go wrong is if you build it, they will come. Exactly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or, or the very or the variation of that is that sales takes a very short period of time. Yes. Sales is. <laughs> what do you? What is this? Uh, it just went off. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. So that that's a that's a very <laughs> classic one. Is that either like. Um, I had a, I, when I worked at NASA and CMU, um, I used to have a lab head that would say that, he's not head of that lab no more. So, um, the, if, if you build it, you, they will come is one of my least favorite sayings. Please don't do that. And yes, totally agreed. Like, uh, sales is, what? Nothing will go wrong. Yes. <laughs> uh, favorite one is also, I asked, I asked a fellow previously, um, what's going to break first? And he says, it's not going to break. <laughs> um, and that's actually a really dangerous assumption. Whatever you're, if you are making a hardware object, um, something will break, and if you don't know what will break, it can frequently be something catastrophic like a weld, 
Um, especially if you're making something like, I don't know, I don't want to pick on Jim, but it was Jim. Uh, <laughs> uh, so he, he says, uh, he says, like, uh, well, you know, for, for, a, for a motor like that, that can actually be, like, pretty catastrophic if it spins through and, and causes a fire and kills people. So it's much better to have a known failure mechanism that will fail first, and then they'll bring it in, and the whole thing can be inspected, and they can put back in and be much happier. It's also sales guys like that, but um, that's a slightly sleazier version of that. Anyone else have a non let's get into some non-manufacturing ones, because I feel like we're doing too much manufacturing, and I know that a bunch of you are not manufacturing. Quasi-manufacturing, so biotech. Yep. Worked for a company, we did a thing that depends on this enzyme. We bought it in big jug lots, and once we got through the jug, we're like, let's go get some more of that. The next one didn't work the same as the first one. Yes! You cannot always buy the same shit over and over and over. This is a big one. This is a really big one. Similar one is, um, is I know a lot of teams are integrating with incomplete projects, and they're like, oh, wham, my life is so hard. I'm integrating this robot with this arm, and they keep changing the arm. Well, it's like, no, you're doing it. You're both doing product integration on an unfinished product. Like, you get, the, you, get the, you get the mating interface, and you don't get a whole lot else. If you expect something else, you are setting yourself up for disappointment. Um, what's up? Is that your hand? Oh, I was just going to add one. Yeah. Oh, please. You don't even have to raise your hands, guys. Just shout. Hmm. I mean, this is, sorry, this is still manufacturing, but, like, uh, you have to, like, make sure you account for lead times when you're, like, doing something, because if you're doing anything in quantity, it'll take time to get the yes. quantity of parts, almost no matter what it is. Don't, be don't believe the shipping schedule. Yeah, yeah similar yeah. thing is pay net 30. Anyone had that one when you uh, do a contracting job? You'll be paid. Your job's complete. All right, well, I'm going to pay you within 30 days of after you completed that job. So don't float checks that you are expecting to cash. Um, huh. Give yourself a little more lead time. Anyone else got one? Yeah, net, net 30, Johnny, means maybe 60, probably 90. <laughs> yes. That's enough. Don't believe pay net 30 either. Like, <laughs> you will be paid at some point. Like, so frequently, um, a lot of the reason to, to, to hire a lawyer is to uh, is basically to have the lawyer discourage um, net 30 from getting a little out of hand. It's like one of the pri for contractors, it's like one of the primary, especially uh, graphic and design people, um, because... So often they're paid. like... If you're a graphic designer, you never get paid. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, oh, you know, like, paying at 30, oh, we decided not to use that. The project that you were contracted to lost funding. Fuck you, pay me. Yeah. By the way, it's a great lecture. If you search on Vimo, fuck you, pay me. <laughs> um, it's a great lecture. Little little tedious, little specific. You've seen this? Yeah. Yeah. It was pretty good. Um, so if you ever start doing contracting, I strongly advise that you um, look into that. Yeah. Personal case history on that. When I went crazy a long time ago and decided to start a consulting company, basically design, hardware design and software development companies in the mid-70s, <laughs> a long time ago, like before before your parents were dating. Um, I know, when the dinosaurs yeah. roamed the earth. I always, I, always tell, I always tell the story that the very first year we were in business, my tax return for the year showed $16,000 worth of income, and my wife had made 24000 of that as a registered nurse. What? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't. Anyone else? They're not used yeah, to it. Well, they're <laughs> they're 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 wow. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody else got some shenanigans that, like, they, that, like, in hindsight, it's like, oh. Like every database ever, like they make assumptions, like, oh, somebody's name will never be longer than a hundred characters. Thank you. Buffer overflow. That is like also buffer on the related note. Buff like um. Yeah. Buffer overflow attacks and that kind of shenanigans. Yeah, your name will never be longer than this. You will never have two addresses. You will never have this, this, and this. Yeah. And honestly, there will only be these five different keys used for input, so don't worry about the t trapping the all other keys. Yeah, so exactly. one of the things we're going to talk about later is um, is like an obsessiveness to over-engineer. Premature yeah. optimization and premature scaling are the enemies of flexibility. Um, because like, oh, I made it so that we can hold like, you know, seventy thousand people's names. Oh, now our now our products for dogs. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> now we have to make we have to add like the dog and the owner and like do all this shit. Um, so like, please don't come out of here being like the way to not have problems is to prepare for every eventuality and never launch a product ever. Um, because I really don't want you to come out of that with this. Um, what would be much more positive is to come out of this with knowing um, don't don't commit to inflexibility before you know it's safe. The variation, on, the variation on that is that every step in your process, give yourself a way out in case it screws up or in case you're wrong about your assumption. Particularly when you bring a product to market, you 
sell one or two. Don't assume you're going to sell 10,000 of them. Give yourself a way out in case the market that you, for what you just built was two. And you have something else, you need something else, do something else with it. Okay. So now we're going to go, like, I think that, like, we, like, as, like, I think it'll be positive to come back to this at the end, but I feel like at, right now the topic's just too broad and this brainstorming isn't as fiery as maybe, um... Phone o'clock. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, so the next thing we want to go to is, I think, really important for the fellows, is when shit goes wrong, um, I think a lot of people, especially in this program, are reasonably clever, um, and so they're used to brute forcing their way through problems. Um, and if there's anything I could really get through, is please stop it. <laughs> um, because this is this is like the jock, of, like the, the nerd equivalent of Hulk smash. Like I have a problem, I will work harder. Yes. Um, and I understand that like maybe prior to this point you haven't been challenged to your full capacity, and so when you meet a minor roadblock, just overpowering it with brute force is an acceptable tactic. Um, I want you to stop it, please. Um, I want you to have the capacity to disengage, back up, check your assumptions, and look for an easier approach path of attack. Um, like I, ha I have a very like very very classic. Um, you know, scenario of like, uh, I, I ask them like, what are you gonna do if this doesn't work? Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try harder. I'm gonna work more hours. I'm gonna work seven days a week. I'm gonna, I'm gonna never sleep. I'm gonna, I'm gonna snort like monster drinks. Like, you know, um, <laughs> please, like, uh, maybe, maybe your like raw intellect will overcome this, um, but it probably won't make you the happiest in your personal life. And if you don't, you are so fucked. Um, at the point where you are like clocking all the hours. Uh, it's crunch time. You have everybody working overtime. You are like you're you're basically trading in. Um, they have this in video games where like you you have like the you can buy like you can uh, what's that thing with um with Starcraft? You can buy the mules that like haul way more minerals but yeah. are like way less yeah. efficient and eventually break. That's what you're doing. Um, you are cashing in your health, the relationships of your company, and like a lot of other things on this bet. And so you better be sure that this is the bet you want to make. Because uh, at the point where you're pushing everybody up against the wall like that, it's going to get real hard to back out. So before, and there's times when you do that, and there's times when I've done that to my teams, and it's been good. But like, you want to make sure you're ready to make that trade. Um, what is easier is to back off and check the assumptions. My uh, least favorite call I ever got was someone calls me and says, uh, Hey, Katie, can I borrow an angle grinder? I'm like, why do you want an angle grinder? And I'm like, well, because I had a manufacturer send me some parts and they're not to spec, so I'm gonna use an angle grinder. Um, and like, that is an approach. Um, the approach that I think would be much more favorable would be back up and say, why did my manufacturer send me the wrong parts? The parts that are coming next month, will they be wrong too? Um, like, do I need to get a different manufacturer? Like, uh, am I using materials? <laughs> or a manufacturing method that doesn't produce the tolerances that I need? These are the better questions to be asking. Um, so if anyone is so brave as to like want to go with a problem they have right now, we can like tr we can do like a practice like reverse and look at it bigger. Is anyone so brave? Wait, we're just discussing a problem? Yeah, yeah give, me a, give me a problem. We're going to well, back up so and, and uh, analyze it further back. back. What's up? So I've always worked like solo. Uh, I I write code. So yeah. on programming projects. And now I have a few contracts. But I'm having trouble delegating and giving it to them. Because they're okay but they're not that great. Okay. So I kinda of finding myself micromanaging them. Yes. Um and I'm trying to strike a balance between letting them like go haywire on this and not totally screw it up. So they can come back to me. Next Are you communicating the master plan well enough that they could try not micromanaging? Yeah, and let's let's ask them some more basic questions. You, that 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 is certainly key. But the underlying assumption there, there's two of them. One is that they're as bright as you are. He said they're not. Not necessarily the case. Okay? He, said, he says he knows they're not. Because there's a bell curve and stuff. Okay? Half, half these programmers are dumber than average. It's going to happen. The other, part of it, the other part of it is, did you do a realistic estimation of the time frames using normal programmers or normal developer mindset versus your ability to deliver? Because these guys don't care as much. They're, they're not as driven as you are to get it done. So you made that assumption that they're as driven as, as you are. If you, if you back away from those two, you've got to get down a path that I, he's talking about. Yeah, the other, I think the other like underlying assumption we should look at is, like, have you communicated, like, because if they're, 
if if they are like kind of like blindly fo following you in the dark and they don't know where the big plan leads, um, it's going to be really hard for them to guess what you want, and you're going to go further and further down this bad feedback loop of having to micromanage them. Even go one step further back. What's the programming technique that you're using to develop whatever you're developing? I have no idea what your project is. Uh, what programming technique? Yeah, I mean, how, what is what's the methodology you use? How how do you how do you build whatever it is you're going to build? How do you describe it? <laughs> uh, you, you start writing uh, a ta task, you say, okay. Go, no, we're looking, we're looking for, like, how do you communicate objectives? How do you, how do you, how do you communicate objectives to your team? And how do you, how do you determine what objectives to follow next? So, okay, that's part of the issue. So we, we have a team of a few guys, and so we, like, sit there on a whiteboard and talk to each other coding for a few hours. So he's in another country. Yes. Um, he's coming to join us full time in about two months. Okay. And I think it'll be worth it when he's here, but he's less productive than anybody else right now in another country. Um, are the beatings at a hard time for him to come? Are you waking him up at like yeah, five in the morning? He's in Russia. So Moscow, okay. So that's kind I of was really not useful at my team meetings when I had to do 5 a.m. Hong Kong meetings. Yeah. Just FYI. Mm -hmm. so, so the issue is that most of our meetings are like face to face, and then trying to communicate like complex ideas to him after the fact takes me will twice as long as after the meeting twice. Yes. yes. Um, and he's also not very fluent in English. So that's another issue. Do you have a good bug tracker? Yeah. Well, I mean, we're pre, -pre product. But, yeah, Do you have a good bug it? tracker you're using to, to track your features and what it means for a feature to be complete and what the like and what the feature's supposed to look like? Uh, no, we're still coming up with like how the feature should look. We're very, very early stage. Okay. Um, I think that. But we could add one. They're all awful. Is like pivotal. Is that <laughs> they're they're all awful. To be perfectly honest. They're awful. better than nothing. Just pick just pick one and stick with it, yeah. and don't write your own. You don't have time. Okay. Yeah. And, and kind of the point is what happens <laughs> is whenever you have those discussions, instead of doing them face to face, sometimes you're doing them online. So they're time insensitive, and it's self documenting as you go through. It's kind of painful, but. Even if it's less productive for there's like four of us here in one hand, one hand, it's better to, for us to have one meeting that's less fluent between all of us rather than have we two. We can still talk face to face. I, I meant fluent. Yes, but then I have to have two meetings. Don't, I'm, not, I'm saying don't have two meetings. Okay, so combine them. At, at, well, I mean, I'm actually, I'm not advocating for any particular number of meetings. What I'm advocating for is write down the ideas as you make them and, uh, and make it because I think that also, like, People don't tune into all the meetings. Like people, especially like there's distractions, especially if they're like through the computer. There's IMs, there's internet, there's Reddit, there's things. Um, and so uh, the meeting, like if the meeting can just provide the higher level roadmap to yes. what you're actually making, um, and then they can go back and find the details instead of having to pull them out of their memory, I suspect we'll get better results. It, it kind of walked down that same path. Um, seven years into my consulting company, I tried, I figured out how to actually make money at this. Uh, versus losing my ass like I did the first two years. Um, we would take uh, software <coughs> development tasks, software <coughs> hardware development tasks, but mostly software tasks that had ridiculously short delivery times. And I, I would incent my team by saying if we, if we hit it or we hit it, we would bid these all fixed, fixed cost. They get a monster bonus if we hit it on time, less so if we stretched it out. They'd still get paid, but it would be just, just less of a bonus. But the technique that we found that was really effective because not all these folks could be there at the same time. If we developed our systems, God help me, in English, okay? every block of that system was developed and fully documented, fully written up in English before we wrote line number one of code. We found what we could do, but we, when we did that, we could take portions of it and say, okay, this has to talk to the rest of the world like this, and write our interface specially, especially these modules. That allowed us then to break this task up. It didn't matter what time of day, so we worked on it. We didn't have the benefit of online communication. Well, you go there's email, but it's like we. Really it took a while. Yeah. Okay. It was like you waited for somebody else to log on to your bulletin board to do email. Um, but we found that we could develop, have team members that were working ridiculously odd hours because the documentation was done so well up front. And the thing, when it's done, it's the comments for the code anyway. So it's, you got to comment the code anyway. So you might as well do it this up front. And that's just, that technique still holds today. So it's something to, it's something to consider. I Especially if you got a guy from Russia. Yeah. Does anybody have a good tool for like we have, we know how features should work should look, 
I also know how it should be built. Uh, how do I combine both of those? Sorry. Nothing. Wait, what do you mean? For, so I, I, I both have what it should look like, like UX, like wet wireframes, and I know how the API should look. But I, I don't know how to combine those two so I can hand it to somebody. A real crude low-level thing I use is called Pencil. <laughs> and pictures of it? Yeah, uh, it's, 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 it's a mock-up thing, and you can actually... There's some symbols where you can use to embed functions, like if you do this. Oh, I thought you were joking, saying you use no, an no, actual no, pencil. No, it's pencil.exe. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> that, that's the name of the program, and it's PC and Mac. Yeah, I definitely thought you were joking, too. Sorry. <laughs> I, I use felt and pen. <laughs> <laughs> the, the reason they call it that, though, is instead of having this really slick thing where it looks like it's a demo, all of the symbols in it are, like, off-kilter, so it looks like somebody sketched it out, so nobody thinks, oh, this is the way we've got to do it. It's kind of like, no, 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 this is the sketch, and we're going from here. I just thought of another assumption that I've made twice, actually, and that's like, I'm really busy. I'll get an intern, and that will help. Mm -hmm. um, interns cost a lot of time up front, and if it's a good intern, you'll get to keep them long enough for, the, for you to pay that time back. Um, but, like, an intern is not an immediate labor-saving device. Um, your first and a half with your intern will actually be a massive time loss. You should not take one on when the shit is hitting the fan. Um, you, you actually indicated a little bit of a broader problem, and you touched on this earlier. Uh, when we talked about premature scaling, you may be premature coding. Okay, you, you don't, it sounds like you haven't redesigned your product all the way through, and yet you've got guys that start, are, are starting to hit the keyboards already. I'd follow up down, down this, this suggestion. I think it's an excellent one of sketching this thing up. And then you get done, the Russian guy can read it done uh, whenever he wants. You don't have to get up at like 6 o'clock in the morning to talk to the guy. And another thing that kind of really comes out of that is, like, there's nothing like having a huddle of people saying, let's do this and try something out, and you should still do that. But in six months, you guys are not going to remember what you said. And even when you think, oh, no, no, this was important stuff, and we'll remember why we did it, what you end up doing whenever you have these conversations in a bug tracking tour or whatever, you're documenting your assumptions. And then you can go back and say, oh, we thought that this was going to be for people and not dogs, and now it's for dogs. Also going to be really big when you hire your fifth person. Mm -hmm. When you hire your, you said you have four people working for you? It's a bit of uh, my team, yeah. When you hire your N plus one person, um, plus, yeah. they're going to come in cold. Yeah. And they're going to be frustrated uh, with like not understanding why anything is and, and there's like a morale issue. Um, and so that's another kind of like, please don't there, there is a form of premature scaling and premature building that is like the super premature documenting, but I don't think you're flirting with it yet. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, let's not focus too much on his. Like, it's a cool thing when you take it offline, but like, I think we've exceeded the yeah. everybody else's use one, of one this example. Quick, one last quick shot at that too. Uh, variation on that same thing. When you're hitting, the, when you're bump, starting to bump against the deadline, all of a sudden you more bandwidth. You want to bring three people in to meet that deadline. Now you can take chunks of that and stop and go out. Okay, who else is running into a problem that we need to back up and look at from another angle? Who's having a hard time generating sales for whatever it is they're building? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a little far for the fellows, though. I think most of the fellows don't have a product yet to sell. Am I... Okay, well, let's look back a little bit. Who's pitching investors? Yep. There you go. <laughs> I think we'll find some of those. Okay. That's, is that really the same thing as selling? Um, in a, in a lot of ways, you're, you're, the order is the, you're, you're out there pitching your project, and the order you're going to get is the guy stroking you a check, which is kind of cool stuff. And touching on what some of the stuff that um, um, we were talking about earlier, investors, some some of the folks in the crowd here don't do angel investing. One of the issues that investors will look at very closely is what's your step-by-step -step plan, and what's the granularity of that step-by-step -step plan. And, uh, and the flip side of that is the risk factors. You've got a plan, I'm going to build this, I'm going to turn lead into gold with this lead into gold contraption. And first I do this, and I write the code for it, and then, it, then we build it, and then we sell it. If that high level stuff is good for a 30 second pitch at a, let me just cocktail party here, at a cocktail party to uh, pitch somebody to listen to you. But when they start saying, okay, what about this? Or have you thought about that? That's the one that really, that's the one that's going to make the difference the angel investor who convinced them that you really know what's going on. We got a, we got a real star in this uh, in the group, by the way, that's really good at that. It's Alex Kislev. This guy, this guy can 
analyze the hell out of something to where he knows what's going to go wrong, wrong what's going to go right at the next step, and he has a plan for it. We should we should back up. His background is currently like his consulting thing. Is he is the one that the VC firm calls when things have gone wrong to potentially replace a CEO and basically marry off the startup. Yep. Can we get? Yeah, we have. So like this is. So like he's used to coming at this from the triage perspective, um, and there's a big difference between asking you to have a plan and to being foolish enough to be committed to that plan. Um, like you need to have a believable method to go from A to B, but um, but by no means are we encouraging you to religiously stick to that plan. Um, and as a matter of fact, everyone's going to ask you for your contingency plans to go to either B prime or the alternate path in A to B. Yeah, every, uh, he's right, every single, I've worked on 17 turnarounds since 1995. Little bitty guys, some decent size. Every single one of them involved changing the company from the product that was originally built to sell. And the founder, in many cases the founder was long gone because the investors had thrown him out. But in most cases, they were bumping their head against the product that they built with no, with no market acceptance. And they weren't asking the simple question of why aren't people buying this? And the, the other part they didn't do was go back to their investors and say, "We need help. We don't. Our product looks like this. People aren't buying it. Who do you know, Mr. Investor Crowd, that we can talk to to figure out what we should do with our product?" As Tell about the time you wouldn't sell, sell phone service. <laughs> this, uh, I, one of my, I started a telecom company in 1991. I won't bother with, with the details of it. Our target market was selling wholesale services, something we laughingly called enhanced services back then. Today, it's like a joke, like calling cards and fancy 800 service and all that. Just small long-distance carriers. Because the long-distance market was very fragmented 10 years ago, 20-some uh, years ago. And uh, there was like AT&T, MCI, and Sprint at the top, another 15 guys in the next tier, and 500 and some small guys. And the small guys would sell their services basic standard one plus long distance calling to small businesses. And just as soon as that small business needed a fancy service, like calling cards or 800 routing, small guys would have to go buy it from one of the big guys and resell it. Hey, do and you need any guys, I'm sorry, do you play? No, like, okay. And if the, big, if the big guys were really smart, the big guy's sales guy was really smart, he would say, oh look, this guy just bought some of these 800 stuff from us, I'll go call on that customer myself. Mm -hmm. And he take the business away from the small guy. So the small guy got the opportunity to go find new customers which was not very, very appealing to the small guys. So we came up with a product that was that was allowed us to custom build these services very quickly. We took all the coding out of the hands of the developers and put together a simple process that our sales guys could change the functionality of the product. Without going through a lot of that, we were having some success selling this, but not nearly enough to get profitable. Our target market was these small guys. I used to have a buddy of mine who worked for the number six carrier in the U.S. He used to come over to my house all the time uh, he used to, his dinner, his dinner on the road consisted of a bucket of chicken wings and a fifth of Jack Daniels. This guy used to, <laughs> to play with. He was, he was head of engineering for the number six carrier in the U.S. And he was trying to get me to sell services to him in whatever way, but I, but he, I wouldn't come off my business model. My business model was X cents a call. And Kevin finally said, his exact words were, asshole, let me show you how this works. And he said, we're going to pay you $100,000 a month flat fee, and 10% over your costs. And every 90 days, we'll figure out what the costs are, we'll adjust that price up and down. That's what we're going to do. I said, Kevin, I'll never make any money at that. He says, you don't understand. That's below our cost of doing any of these services. And it was marginally profitable. We ended up, we, uh, ended up signing a deal with them. Within six months, we were wildly profitable. They weren't, even, they weren't on my radar. The next big account we closed was a company called U.S. West, which was a bell company at the time. Not only not on my radar, the Antichrist, okay? These guys hated <laughs> us. To this day, if you, if you get a calling card from U.S. West, it still runs on our platform, which is owned by Global Crossing, which is the death enemy of, of what's now Quest. So it's interesting stuff. I would never have gotten there with somebody being on my, because I was so committed to this business model. I was an engineer. What the hell? I don't know better. Uh, I was so committed to this business model, I would not change. Those guys beat on me. Literally, Otherwise, literally I, I took them by the shirt and shook them. Yeah, and I was I, and I was spending my own cash on this thing. We we burned a million dollars of our own money to get this thing started. We had investors in this thing already. We're gonna we're gonna crash. We're gonna crash and burn without with either another five million bucks. 
or we would crash and burn. And so, I mean, I'm not the expert on recognizing this. Uh, the plus side is I did take that, I took good notes when that happened to me and recognized that the, the times I screwed up in that whole process were not asking the right questions about the market. Why is this not selling as fast as it should? You know, which is kind of cool. Big problem there was that our sales office was in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, which it turns out is really hard to get people to come visit. Mm -hmm. I, I know it's hard to imagine. It's hard to get people to come visit. One of our fundamental assumptions was we're operating in Cedar Rapids. We should have an office in Chicago. Or someplace like that, someplace like a, like a real airport. Uh, so it's really easy, like especially when this has been your baby for so long, to get really committed to this is how it's going to work. Um, and it's really healthy. This is one of the reasons that like the Seal Foundation puts so much time in having you rub shoulders with lots of different people yeah. is the hope that one of them will smack you upside the face when you're retarded. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, don't ask, don't be afraid to ask for help because uh, the I, I've done a lot of turnarounds the last the last. 15 10 years, and now we have a, a business that formally focuses on that. But a lot of cases went from the leader of the company was afraid to ask the board for help because he or she would lose face or an ego from the way, to modifying the financial statements to keep the board happy, to lying on the financial statements to keep the board happy, to doing crooked things like in one case selling 330% of their stock. Uh, to uh, withholding, not paying taxes, all those crazy things, burying themselves because they were afraid to ask for help. So, you know, ask early. What's the worst, what's the worst your investors can do to you? If they, if they fire you and bring somebody else to make your company successful, you want a bunch of shares of the damn thing anyway. They probably won't fire you, they might bring a new CEO in, but that's the worst that can happen is they, they, they do something to make it successful. Yeah, I think, um, don't ask for the angle grinder. Yeah. Like, that's another thing, is like, uh, is that frequently people come to me and they're like, I'm having a problem, I need, a, I need a, a manufacturer for this very complicated widget. I have a bug in my code that I can't reproduce. Will you come look at my code? And the answer is no, your mentors won't. Um, and that's like really hard. It, but if you ask the, the question after you've backed up a little bit, you're much, it's much higher level, and you're much more likely to get the kind of engagement and time you need from the experts. Because it is kind of a turnoff when someone comes to you with a very specific thing, like, hey, we're going to have to go through for an hour, and you're also putting your mentor in, in the same blinders you have. And even if your mentor is much smarter than you, you're setting yourself up to have the same failure. So try to back up when you ask your mentors for help. Better results all around. Um, so don't ask for the angle grinder. Say, my part came in wrong. I think I need an angle grinder. It's a much, you're much more likely, I mean, maybe you'll just get the angle grinder, but like, uh, but you're much more likely to get an actual solution that will help you going forward. Yeah, I was mentioning the guy that does good planning, that's the guy that does good planning of the team right now, so talk to him uh, on a one-on-one -on -one basis, too. But you get to be, you get to be a mentor, a mentor or a mentor <coughs> at the same time. Cool. <laughs> Uh, what other war stories can we swap? Where are we at, yeah. on, where are we at on time? Does anybody? Five minutes. Five minutes. Really? All right. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the, the third part we wanted to go to is, is how to ask for help um, just before we go. And that was, like, ask the higher level question. If you want to go through, I think we can just fill the um, extra time with, like, I have this problem and we can practice backing up if you're not good at backing up yet. Or we can just talk about more shit assumptions we've made in the past that are hilarious. You've got to back up and ask the question. The, the, the assumption, the wild ass assumption that somebody wants your product is a, a question to ask. Uh, my very first turnaround after my telecom company was a healthcare IT company. And nobody, when you guys were like five years old, okay, we had this move towards national healthcare. Gee, sounds familiar. We had a move towards national healthcare in the early 90s. And a software company developed this fabulous product. She took the plastic card, went to the doctor's office, and swiped the card, the doctor created you, and put all the codes in the machine before you left the office and said, it'll be $20 cash, your credit card, your insurance comes, all taken care of, no paperwork, no nothing. Tremendous product. They had the technology working. The CEO had raised $8 million from the investment banker, immediately bought a building, put marble floors in it, and all that great stuff, ran out of cash. But they developed this technology. So I was a hero because the investment banker that raised it said, come, fix my company. And my ego was big. I just dumped my LD company and made some money on that. So I was so cool I could do this. He raised $4 million on that. 
We put it in there. We fixed some some little IT issues they had. They had they were running it on three PCs on a folding table, which was not enough infrastructure. And they were, they, they borrowed they don't, those weren't even their own PCs. They borrowed those. Um, but we put two little data centers in, and it didn't scale massively, but just enough to make sure it was reliable. So we had that part down. And we started trying to sell this service. And this was like May or June. November comes around. We have sold zero, nada, not a fucking dime. Okay, not even. There was interest, but not a dime. Our business model was to sell the service through the insurance companies to the doctors. Because this is a lousy $30 a month, so I'm to get off the doctor. It's not going to be very much. You can't call the doctor for that. But the insurance companies had provider relations people that went and talked to the doctors. It turned out that that provider relations person is like the one that goes between Tel Aviv and, and uh, 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 the flip side, flip side, the Israelis and Palestinians. I mean, the Israel and Palestine. They're trying to keep the peace. They're trying to keep the rockets from flying. Because the insurance companies hate the doctors. They know they're trying to screw them on the fees. The doctors hate the insurance companies because they know they're trying to screw them out of payments. They're not talking. We're selling nada. We ended up rethinking the product uh, and backed up and found out that See, but we could sell this thing we're just doing the healthcare claims, just electronic claims. That was cool. We had a bunch of cool technology for that. The doctors would buy that. Oh, let's buy a field sales force doing that with their hundred thousand dollar year base base. Well, you can't drive out to a doctor's office for a thirty dollar month revenue stream how you do that. We actually turned it into a telemarketing model, completely re engineered the packaging of the product. And within two years that's sixty thousand dollars. Sixty thousand doctors on the service. So you can always rethink it. Always a way to rethink it. Don't run out of cash. Our sales guys, when we weren't selling anything, their approach was, we're trying harder. We're going to make more calls. We're going to call on more insurance companies. We're going to put more dinners together. It wasn't going anywhere. So you have to ask that question early. We're going to run with this one. Well, we're going to cash. I think another really key thing for, like, every, like, social media aggregator or whatever is you can get users but not customers. So, like, there's two questions, like, can I get users and can I get paid? Um, and your investors care about one more than the other. It's funny. Um, so, yeah, that is, that is ask yourself both two. questions. She, she said touched on it, but you're looking for investors, guys. You're looking to raise capital in your business. The investor's motivation is not the same as yours. You want your business to be successful. The investor wants to be successful because it's a means for them to get a return on their investment. If someone came along tomorrow and offered them three up on their stock for your company, they'd probably dump it like that. If somebody came along tomorrow and said, we want to take the, take that whole company and crash it and burn it, for Mr. Investors, there's five up on your cash, if you didn't have control, they'd probably take it. So their motivation is completely different. You have to keep that in mind as you're... It's not that they're evil either. It's just yeah. that, like, it's one of, one of the fundamental assumptions, and I actually feel really bad that we didn't get to this, is that everybody has the same goals as you mm -hmm. yeah. um like in, in that in that life we're all we're all pulling for the same team you know culture is you can consider culture to be the summations of people's personal incentives and disincentives um but like you know your vendors want to get paid they don't really care about your product maybe they care about your product your company is surviving to cut them another check um but they don't care about the compatibility of your widgets they don't you know your investors and 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 this is not like to, to be cold or jaded this is just to respect that every person has their own personal motivations inside, and they're not yours. Um, it, it's much more of a respect issue than a cynicism issue. Yeah, I mean, uh, the investors want to be around to invest again tomorrow. That's their job. That's their job. Their job is making return on the capital. It's not to make the world safer, democracy, or whatever it is we're building. It's, it, it's, it's, it, but like everyone, everyone gives you crap. It's like, oh, you're so jaded. You don't believe in people. Yada. It's not. It's. It really is a respect issue. It's. It. it it's, it's. You're respecting them by understanding their motivations aren't yours. Um, and I think that respect goes a long way to maintaining positive relationships so we can have love and karma and hippies um, and all of those things. So. Yeah, it doesn't hurt, doesn't hurt to love your investors. <laughs> right. any, any other, any guys else? Yeah, I feel, I feel like we've been yeah, knocking down hands. Yeah, we were pontificating all this last Yeah, I feel that. like we've been knocking down hands not being too applied. Has anyone else got stuff? Got a, a, a ba basic obvious assumption, which is uh, if someone is sign a contract with you to pay you, and you don't also have to send them a bill. This is a shit assumption. Oh, yes. 
Yes. You do. You need to you build them, and you need to send them W9s. Yep. yep. That's that's pretty key. And a good assumption for you guys who are planning like your financials, you're going to get paid within 90 days if you're lucky. And that's a liability until you get paid. Yeah. We went. We went. Yeah. That's a, that's definitely. Paying at 30 is hilarious. Yeah. My uh, when I had my consulting company, one of the things that made me profitable was I put my wife in charge of AR and accounts receivable and accounts payable. She would. She would. When somebody didn't pay us on 30 days, she would shut them off if we're doing software development. She puts Rockwell, Collins, Avionics on credit hold over a $30,000 bill. Happy for a piece of inventory control software that they needed for um, uh, for a, a helicopter project that they were that they were tracking. They need to have a little software job written in Visual Basic or some crap like that. What's my credit hold? And the first thing, because the first thing department, RAP, had said at 31 days, oh, we only, we only pay you 60 or 90 days. She said, you're on credit hold. They called the president's office and said, here's your project. It's waiting for this software. We're not going to send it to you because you don't pay your bills. My phone number is Maureen Hogan, blah, blah, blah. She gets a call back an hour later from a, his secretary. He says, come pick up your check. And she said, my wife tells him that put it on your account. Your new terms are net 10. <laughs> now, the flip of that was, once she did purchasing, she would buy something from a vendor, and she would get the price negotiated all the way down to wire and say, okay, we'll give you the order. Oh, your terms are net 90, right? 90 days, same as cash. So she would drive the 90 days from vendors, but go for 10 days from our customers. Why? It's cash flow. Mm -hmm. Cash is everything. So that's just something to keep in mind. She's absolutely right. You're not going to get paid in time. Anybody else got one? Oh, one thing is also is like making like a special thing that's like an email address is called like or, or like a mail a physical mailbox is called like accounts receivable and accounts payable always sounds like a laughable overscaling issue until you're in the situation I am in right now where we raised a quarter million dollars for Hacker Dojo and I don't know who paid because we have like 30 different vendors and, and like 30 different donors and like you know I have to go through it's actually very embarrassing to have to go through the bank accounts and like and like go through every little like because we have you know we get we get $100 membership dues like we get 7 to 12 of them a day mm -hmm. and so I have to sort out and like so, like sort all income for, by this month and then filter all, all the $100 ones and then like okay who's who's like Who's this, like, you know, Theo Foundation? You know, like, uh, like, just go, like, that's that's an embarrassing situation to be in. It's an extremely time-consuming situation. So the one thing I say is not premature scaling is accounts receivable and accounts payable. Yeah. Uh, you should have them now. Yeah, along those lines, kind of like keeping track of your your books. You've probably heard this lecture. Yeah, Daniel's back. I know you've heard this lecture about keeping all your receipts because you, you, know, you know, at the end of the year you're gonna wish the hell you had them. The same thing applies to your business. Get, a, get a, some sort of accounting processes in place early. You don't have a lot of time in it, but you're going to oh, care. We have a really cool um, email me. I forget the name of the product. I'm really sorry, but we have a really cool product we use at Hacker Dojo. You take a photo of the receipt and it digitizes it. Lemon. Okay, that one's cool too. That's not the one we use. Um, there's also ones where the, where you can just like mail a box e of receipts. Expensify. And expensify. Expensify. Thank you. This yeah. is the one we use. Um, and if you are really lazy and fail at life, pay five dollars a month. Yep. It's a kind of a lot of solutions to like problems with being a grown up. If you really can't it hack it, yet a subscription is a service to yeah, fix the fact that you're not an adult. And I'm, and I'm the worst one in the world getting I'm expensive awards. I just kind of literally pack one shuttle black. Yeah. I do mine once a quarter because I have to get quarterly reports out. So I have nothing once a quarter. Oh, I remember a stupid assumption I made. Um, I assume that everybody had the same end of year as I did. Um, yes. Our land, like our end of year for Hacker Dojo, is December 31st. <coughs> um, our landlord's end of year is June 30th. Um, like a bunch of our sponsors' end of year is in either Q1 or Q3. Um, and this is really important, especially if you're doing sales and whatever else, because it's important to know when people get the new money to give to you. And um, also when their budgets are going to be. When their bud, yeah. So when they when they have to use up the rest of their budgets, uh, uh, you know, for for certain things, and when new budgets come to be used up, um, these are both really important questions. Yeah. So you should you should be tracking if you work with someone and you do and you do money things with them, um, because one time we once and this is legal, um, but talk to your tax person. Hacker Dojo prepaid our rent 
by like nine months when we were not a 501c3 yet to avoid taxes. Because of an expense we committed to for the upcoming year, um, and we were going to have to pay taxes on like $100,000, we prepaid our rent. It was great. Yeah, the, uh, Don't take tax advice from me, but do think with your head. If you, if, if you get the impression that we're talking about a lot of shit that doesn't have anything to do with what you're building, like finances and keeping an accounting, it's because it's going to bite you in the butt someday from either your investors or tax guys or your bank or somebody or your or your employees because you're going to run out of cash. So you, you know, cash is, cash is the gas in your tank. The real, the real goal is kind of like to be like, is, 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 you're going to be here and be like, huh, weird trivia, huh, weird trivia, hey, what am I assuming that I shouldn't be assuming that someday will be my weird trivia? Um, because, like, this weird trivia seems, like, not applicable, but it comes from all kinds of weird places. Like, all kinds of weird, like, the, the thing you're, like, you very rarely get bitten in the ass by the shit you were looking at, you know? Um, so, like, please, like, like, I know it sounds very trite to challenge your assumptions, guys, but please do. Um, especially, no offense, since a lot of you are real green. Um, so, your assumptions are going to come from a book that you read that might be outdated, or like a mentor that hasn't done business in this place for many years, or academia, which doesn't have to turn a profit, or other weird places. You, you, are, you, are, you are set up to have a lot of incorrect assumptions. There was, yeah, there's, um, and you listen to the outside world to be real, realistic. Um, when we, when we first started working on a project that we're working on now, we thought it might be a venture fund that we were trying to do. And we were, so we were going to raise a venture fund. So put a lot of work and thought process into that until somebody ever put it ever so eloquently that we're not going to invest in you with a fund. I said, why is that? Because odds are in 10 years, you'll be fucking dead. Because I'm old enough that a 10-year fund, I might very well be dead. So that was killing the whole idea. And that gave us a, a little a thought process that, gee, maybe we shouldn't be raising a fund, maybe we should take a different approach towards this. And it opened up a whole other approach to what we're doing that turns out to have a lot more appeal than a fund for investors. So there's good stuff that comes out of this, but you got to be listening to it and challenging your assumptions every time. We just assumed it had to be a fund. Anybody else? Yeah, I'm going to go Okay, I think we're probably... Yeah, we probably just go get some food or something. Yep. Yeah. I don't want to, like, keep you guys forever. Yeah, hope, I hope this was helpful. Don't know if it was or not, but if it, if it wasn't, then we made an assumption. That, that <laughs> yeah. <was fine. laughs> Thanks so much.